Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, thank you all for coming. I'm vaguely surprised at this, um, but it's nice to see some people that I can, I've blackmailed in the room to come along, so that's always a positive thing. Um, the, what I'm, going to, I'm going to try and make this as general as possible, and try and make it as um, big as possible in terms of some of the ideas uh, I want to talk about. Um, the, the background to this is, um, a few years ago I edited um, a collection with uh, Frank Fergus at Ulster University, as it now is, on uh, revising Robert Burns in Ulster, um, which looked at sort of uh, poetry and uh, identity politics and religious life in the north of Ireland um, in the last couple of centuries. And recently I've been working on uh, an essay for an edited collection led by Colin Kidd uh, and Jerry Crothers at the University of Glasgow on literatures in union. Um, which is due out uh, next year and it's focusing primarily on Scots and uh, the Anglo-Scottish Union of 1707 but there's also an Irish bit in it as well which I'm um, uh, contributing to. So what I'm talking about today is the, the idea of union and the importance of Presbyterian religion as a way of underpinning if you like identity politics and as a way of expressing identity politics through various forms of literature between about 1790 and about 1860. So those are the general sort of like uh, parameters uh, that I'm going to be uh, talking about. And I suppose in terms of the, the source material, um, much of the focus of historians has been on poetry, and particularly vernacular poetry, so-called Ulster Scots poetry, uh, which was uh, uh, published in Ulster between about 1770 uh, 1850, 1860. Um, John Hewitt, who we'll uh, talk about more uh, during this uh, presentation, reckoned that between about 1800 and 1870, there were about 450 volumes of poetry uh, published in Ulster by around 220 different authors, um, which is quite a, a sizable amount um, of uh, literature produced uh, during that uh, period. And the lion's share of scholarly attention um, has been on those poems written in a Scots vernacular, Ulster Scots as it's known um, as. Um, particularly James Orr, whose uh, monument this is at uh, Ballycarry uh, near Larne, uh, and also Samuel Thompson um, as well. And a number of these poets, of course, have had their poems republished in recent uh, years. Now, I suppose I should begin by saying, first of all, that scholars of Anglo-Irish literature, of literature in Ireland, have not paid much attention um, to the, the Scottish uh, background, to this literary uh, form. When scholars have talked about it, they have tended to talk in very simplistic terms about the relationship between religion, politics and uh, literary uh, culture. Uh, essentially, they draw up a dualism between, on the one hand, uh, Enlightenment theology and liberal politics, which is good, generally speaking, against bad conservative theology and conservative politics. And of course, the reason why scholars focus on this dualism is because it helps try and explain the bizarre political transformation of Irish Presbyterians. How on earth was it that when the Society of United Irishmen was set up in Belfast in October 1791, all well, but one of the original members were Presbyterians? But yet by the time you get to the first home rule crisis in 1885-1886, Presbyterians are overwhelmingly unionist in politics. So the interpretation of the literature produced in this period is used as a proxy or as a way to try and think about the political um, uh, changes within Irish uh, Presbyterianism. There are, I think, problems with this. And one of the things I want to do in our the main thing I want to do in uh, this uh, paper presentation is to try and suggest that that is not a very helpful way of thinking about Presbyterians, politics and literary uh, culture. Um, it ignores the variety of Presbyterian religious and political opinion and also stereotypes uh, Presbyterians. If Presbyterians are talked about at all by Irish historians, it's either to sort of implicitly praise them as being Republican and secular, but at the same time to also say they're dour and puritanical and not particularly friendly to the life of the mind, uh, for instance. Um, don't worry, my monograph will be more than one chapter on the Irish Presbyterian mind, but um, um, hopefully I'll put that uh, right. So um, I want to try and suggest that this literary culture that we're going to talk about is much more complex than this dualism uh, 
uh, would uh, suggest. And I also want to suggest that the focus on vernacular poetry, this Ulster Scots poetry, obscures a whole, a vast amount of uh, poetry and prose that was produced during this period that isn't vernacular. Even James Orr, um, the Bard of Bally Carries, he's known as, only um, less than 15% of his published output was written in the vernacular. 85% was written in standard poetical forms of the late 18th uh, and early uh, 19th uh, century. So, um, I suppose the other thing I need to say, just by way of pre uh, preliminary uh, uh, points, is I am a historian. I'm not a literary specialist, and I'm a bit tone deaf when it comes to poetry, as my wife continually uh, reminds me. Uh, so please do, if I say anything, uh, if you're a literature specialist, if I say anything that sounds particularly crass, just give me a fool's pardon and beat me up outside rather than in front of uh, other people, uh, please. So there are two um, parts to the paper. The first, I'm going to look at the way this poetry and literature has been read. And secondly, I'm going to then focus on a particular poet in the 19th century, uh, a gentleman called William uh, Macomb. So hopefully that'll give a bit of uh, meat uh, to uh, the bones. So let's begin then by talking about the way that this literature has been read um, by scholars uh, and by uh, interested groups. And I suppose the first way we could think about Ulster Scots, of course, is unionist identity politics, uh, which is, of course, a part of what we might call the culture wars in present day. Uh, Northern Ireland, the development of an Ulster Scots identity. And I suppose, um, speaking as a historian, particularly as a historian of Presbyterianism, um, I think it's important to look at the prehistory of this. This is not something that's new. The links between Ulster and Scotland have been incredibly important to Presbyterians uh, in the north of Ireland since they came uh, to Ulster in the early uh, 17th um, century. And Presbyterian historiography has looked back to its year zero uh, to the, the coming of the first Scottish minister to Ulster in 1613 and the formation of the first Presbytery in 1642. So from that point of view, the Ulster Scottish links are crucially important in terms of understanding how Presbyterians, <coughs> the largest Protestant group in modern day Northern Ireland, understand um, themselves. Ulster Scots identity, of course, becomes politically very important during the Home Rule crisis. Uh, of the late 18th uh, and early uh, 19th century, where, as this uh, piece of propaganda demonstrates, it's a way that Presbyterians and Ulster Unionists in general try to appeal um, to their Scottish co religions to support them in opposition against Home Rule. I think it's important to emphasise during the Home Rule crisis that, generally speaking, um, if vernacular is used, it tends to be used in prose rather than poetry. So already we're beginning to see that the focus on poetry might not help get access to all of the literary output of this period. Uh, and there was a development of a particular Ulster Kailyard tradition uh, associated with uh, people like Archibald McElroy. The other point to emphasise as well in terms of this late 19th century period is Ulster Scots literature becomes part of a broader cultural revival in the north of Ireland. And it's interesting that the collections of material that we have in the Lynn Hall Library and in Queens were collected by unionists like William Fee McKinney of Century Hill, but were also collected by cultural nationalists like Francis Joseph Bigger. Um, so there was a general sort of interest in Ulster identity as expressed in particular literary forms in uh, the late 19th century. As we come into the 20th century, Ulster Scots identity remains a, a part of the Stormont Unionist regime. The Ulster Scots Historical Foundation set up in 1957 with the Duke of Abercorn as its president. Um, you know, very much part of a way of asserting uh, the unionism of the Northern Ireland uh, state. And I suppose in terms of the modern manifestation of the Ulster Scots movement, uh, the Ulster Scots Language Society set up in 1992 is often seen as the precursor or the beginnings of the more modern uh, revival of Ulster Scots uh, interests. I, I should say that there is a certain anorak quality to Ulster Scots enthusiasts, as there is a bit enthusiasts for any kind of identity. Uh, and I think it's important to sort of like maybe try and tease out the different motives that individuals have in terms of asserting um, this identity. Some people are just generally interested in it because they're antiquarians or they feel it's part of their culture, whereas others might use it in a much more uh, politically uh, charged 
sort of way. I suppose in terms of uh, literary studies, the main interpretation of this um, uh, literature uh, is associated with this gentleman here, John Hewitt, um, the teetotaler whose um, name has now been used in a pub uh, in the centre of town. Um, John Hewitt um, wrote a book in 1974 called Rhyming Weavers and Other uh, Country Poets of Antrim and Down. It was based on an MA thesis which he originally um, completed at Queen's in uh, the 1950s. And as we know, John Hewitt was trying to develop um, in his public life and in his poetry a, an Ulster, a distinctively Ulster identity that was able to transcend nationalists versus unionists. It was a way to try and make all the inhabitants of this part of the world uh, feel a sense of place and a sense of uh, connection. And in terms of developing this idea of a shared Ulster Scottish literary uh, position, um, one of the things he, he did, um, didn't develop as much as he might have, but one of the things he suggested was that Ulster Scots poets weren't just imitating Robert Burns. That actually Ulster poets and Scottish poets were working in a shared vernacular tradition which back, that went back to Alan Ramsay uh, and to other Scottish poets of the early uh, 18th uh, century. Uh, this was just another language of uh, people in, in the plural form um, a culture that was uh, Northern Ireland. But Hewitt also tried to develop what we might call a collective prosopography of the poets um, between about 1770 and 1850. And he succinctly uh, summarised it as follows. The bards, particularly the rhyming weavers, were Freemasons, members of book clubs or reading societies, and they're often radical and democratic in their politics and liberal in their Presbyterianism. So a very clear sense that these poets, by using their vernacular tradition, were expressing uh, a liberal, implicitly secular, uh, understanding of politics and of identity. Now, despite the fact that, he, uh, that Hewitt had talked about the different poetical traditions which were used by these poets, Hewitt didn't actually think much of them as poets. And he actually thought that these poets were more important in terms of um, expressing popular culture and popular identity at a grassroots level rather than actually reading them um, for any intrinsic literary value that they might have. So these were plebeian poets of place, the bard of Corn Granny, uh, the bard of Gilner Herc, whatever it might be. These were poets who expressed the mindset and the worldview of individuals at a local uh, level. And it has to be said, Hewitt's interpretation has remained remarkably resilient uh, amongst uh, scholars and amongst uh, sort of the general um, uh, reading uh, public. But there have been attempts to try and update what Hewitt was trying to say. Uh, Liam McIlvanny, um, in 2002 I think it was, um, talked about um, these Ulster Scots poets in the context of a shared political radical tradition in Scotland and in Ireland in the 1790s, uh, uh, developing um, the sort of some of the themes and hints that McIlvanny was talking about. Ivan Herbison, uh, one of our colleagues at Queen's, um, talked about rhyming weavers as well, and in language very similar to Hewitt, talked about um, them in, as follows. For more to Herbison, the rhyming weavers are a reminder of the radical dissenting tradition which formed an important part of the Ulster Scots cultural heritage. Their work gives expression to their independence of thought and its vigour exudes a confidence and pride in its cultural distinctiveness. So again, the importance of identity politics here is expressed in, in these uh, poets. He also, um, I think reflecting political historians in general, he also points to the fact that this vernacular tradition ends around the 1860s uh, funnily enough, with his uh, own uh, uh, predecessor, uh, the Bard of Dublin Club, David Herbison. And in addition to talking about modernisation and national education and things like that, he also emphasises the importance of born-again Christianity, of evangelicalism, as a way, as a means of sapping Presbyterians of their radicalism uh, and of their inherent uh, liberal um, ideas. Historians and ethnologists have used this poetry to look at issues like working class life of gender roles in Ulster society in the late 18th and early 19th century. Interestingly, it's only really recently that this poetry has been read as literature. Uh, my 
my collaborator, uh, Frank Ferguson, Carl Barniuk, uh, and others have begun to actually take this literature seriously as literature, trying to develop some of the themes and hints um, suggested by Hewitt in terms of looking at the, um, the different forms of poetry that are used uh, by these uh, poets, the different uh, issues that they're addressing, not just local issues, but issues of more general uh, concern uh, and interest. Carl Barnuke in particular, I think, has been very good at highlighting how even Hewitt himself depoliticised the rhyming weavers, and how in his edition of poems, which he published in 1974, he actually left out uh, many of the stanzas that were much more politically radical, um, particularly James Orr, uh, James Campbell, and uh, others. But the final point I have up here, I think, is possibly the most important one in general terms of Irish studies, and that is there is a significant non-reading of this material. And that is that this material is largely ignored by historians of Irish literature. Um, you will um, look in vain in the field day anthologies for Ulster Scottish literature in any form. Um, it doesn't fit with the idea of an Anglo-Irish tradition, which emphasises the English bit and the Irish bit, but doesn't really talk about the Scottish um, bit. And I suppose... The problem for Ulster Scott's writing, um, or Ulster Scott's tradition, or however you want to call it, is that it is a complex form of identity. And that complexity hasn't really worked well in terms of the culture wars in Ireland over the last 40 or 50 years. The idea of having a complex identity where you could be Irish and Ulster and Scottish and British and European or whatever, those type of hybrid identities, generally speaking, didn't um, weren't very were very helpful in terms of trying to understand Irish history whenever it was being written in the 1980s and early 1990s. So Frank's own um, Ulster Scots writing and mythology I think is a really important intervention in the debate in terms of showing the importance of Ulster Scots um, uh, writing but also its variety, not just vernacular but also um, in standard forms um, as, as well. So, in terms of our overview of, of the readings, what are some of the issues or some of the, the questions that we might want to think about um, a bit more? The first issue is actually the groups that the collective portrait of Hewitt and others exclude um, from uh, their, their, their uh, focus. Most of the poets and writers we're talking about are Presbyterian, but a significant proportion of them are not. Uh, we've got people like Sarah Leach um, from Donegal, a member of the Church of Ireland. We've got Hugh Porter, who's probably a Methodist. We have Joseph Carson, who writes in uh, vernacular and is a Catholic. How do we think about non-Presbyterians in this uh, uh, tradition? What do we think about political moderates, political conservatives, those who aren't actually that interested in politics? Is politics the only way that these um, uh, uh, group, uh, this literature can be read what about literature produced by political conservatives does it matter as much as the radical uh, poets that we focus upon what about the religiously very conservative and this is why I have a, a copy of the Solomon Deacon Covenant up here of those uh, Presbyterians in the 18th and 19th century who believed the British state was apostate because it had given up on the covenants of the early modern period how do we begin to think about those very religiously conservative uh, figures who reject the basis of uh, the British state? second question you need to think about is one of chronology and sources. Is it true that this tradition really petered out in the mid-Victorian uh, period? Um, is it really true that Ivan Herbison's predecessor, uh, David Herbison, was the last of uh, the rhyming weavers? Did industrialisation... Did urban anime really spell the end of this uh, tradition? In terms of uh, mid-county Antrim, that is a moot point because the domestic linen industry actually continued to be incredibly important in the local economy up until 1914. So the idea of factory and industrial production getting rid of these groups of people hasn't actually been borne out by the evidence. And I'm thinking particularly here of the work of uh, Kevin uh, James. It also focuses very much on poetry and published books of poems, the so-called uh, uh, little uh, uh, books that uh, Hewitt talked about. 
there is a sense in which Ulster Scots mm -hmm. literature actually becomes part of a, the popular media in the Victorian period. Ulster Scots becomes a newspaper phenomenon. There are local newspapers with Ulster Scots, um, um, specifically Ulster Scots columns within it. Prose becomes incredibly uh, important. There are different ways of expressing Ulster Scottishness in this period, which I don't think historians have really got their um, head around. And the final issue um, has to do with Presbyterian uh, religion. It is clear that in terms of this portrait we're talking about, um, historians and scholars have a preference for new light forms of, of, of Presbyterianism, theologically liberal forms of Presbyterianism, because that is sexy. That is radical. That is cool. Presbyterians are liberal and open-minded. Oh, isn't that absolutely wonderful? The problem with this is there's also an implicit assumption about what religion actually is in terms of how these um, scholars uh, talk about this. Religion is, a, is determined, or defined in terms of, of function, affirming group identity, relieving stress in uh, changing economic and social circumstances. Now those might well be the natural outcome of religious belief, but religious belief can't be reduced merely to that. And I suppose in the context of um, the aftermath of 9-11, uh, the rise of ISIS and things like that, the idea of religious motivation can be reduced uh, merely to the, the quest for political power or as some means of dealing with problems in society has, I think, uh, been uh, challenged uh, somewhat. It's also the case that the Protestantism, which is talked about here, there's essentially a secular understanding of it. Uh, we like New Light Presbyterians and we like political radicals because they're implicitly modern and secular. We can't quite get our head around the idea that Presbyterians might be theologically conservative, that they might actually have beliefs about God and the world that makes a difference in terms of their attitudes uh, and uh, their outlook. And certainly this idea of, sorry, on the one hand, being theologically liberal and politically liberal, and on the other hand, against conservatives in theology and politics, is still an incredibly powerful way that people uh, try to interpret the Protestant and particularly Presbyterian experience uh, in uh, Ulster. And a lot of my work has been trying to actually tease out the complexity of that and actually to suggest that that dualism um, is uh, perhaps a um, rather unhelpful. But let's try and apply this now to um, some of the poetry uh, and some of the um, material that was produced uh, during uh, this uh, period. And we might as well begin with the 1790s, uh, where Hewitt uh, and others um, have looked at. And I suppose the basic point um, to make here, the more general point, is that Ian McBride and other scholars of Presbyterianism have demonstrated that there is no necessary link between certain types of religious belief and certain types of politics. So for instance, in Rosemary Street in Belfast, you have three Presbyterian congregations, because Presbyterians like to split them and that. In one of those congregations, we had William Bruce, a prominent non-subscriber, one of the first Presbyterians in Ireland to declare himself as a Unitarian. But during the 1790s, he was a paid up member of the Yeomanry and fought against the United Irishmen. Just down the street in third congregation, we had Sinclair Kelburn, Sinclair Kelburn, who by any definition is an evangelical, but yet he was imprisoned in uh, Fort George in Scotland because he, um, of his connections with the Society of United Irishmen. Now that is, a, I think, quite a nice example of how theological conservatism doesn't necessarily equal conservative politics, and there might be other things at play here rather than just uh, theological um, outlook. In terms of the poetry of the period, um, there are obviously new light liberal uh, radicals like James Orr um, whose uh, poems uh, published in 1804 very much express the, the mindset of the, the poets uh, as described by uh, John Hewitt. At the same time we also have uh, conservative writers like uh, Francis uh, Boyle, the bard of uh, Gilner Hurt. Um, who I, I particularly like um, in some ways. Um, he wrote a whole series of poems criticising theological liberals uh, within the church. He supported um, his minister in 1798, a man called Francis Pringle, um, who was forced to leave Ireland, uh, not because he was involved in the 1798 rebellion, 
but because he was against it. And his congregation in Gilnahurk said, get lost, we're supporting the rebellion, we're supporting the United Irishmen. And Pringle was forced out because of his loyalism rather than because of his uh, radicalism. And Francis Boyle, in some ways, sort of demonstrates the conservative uh, mind in some ways, but also the earthiness of uh, Presbyterianism. And it's one of my great joys in life that I did a, a thing on the BBC website about Francis Boyle, and they actually had to put up a parental advisory sticker on it um, because of the language that was used in one of his uh, poems. He, he wrote this wonderful poem uh, called The Paddy's Trip to North Britain, uh, which recounts a, a Catholic deserter from the Irish militia who fled to Scotland. And while he's there, he sits down, he's taking stock of his plight, and he's engaged in conversation by a shepherd. And at that moment in time, that's when his troubles begin because he's attacked by a snake. So let me read you from this, and uh, please excuse me if you can't understand my broad Korean accent at this point. But just as he began to tell, out of a bush beneath the fell, sprang a lang adder near an ell, a monstrous thick, which made poor Patrick gay a yell and draw his stick. Then soon he looked upon his pump and gave the adder such a thump, I was so as his pat, I'll scratch your rump, or I'll cut your head before you give another jump, I'll kill you dead. Yon day as I sat down to shite, what of them thought my arse to bite? I jumped in rage and with a fright as high as the steeple. These cursed things have all a spite at Irish people. Now the reason why I do that is just because my mother would be absolutely outraged that I use the word shite in a public uh, forum. But it also indicates the earthiness of this Presbyterian culture. These people could be seriously, serious, religiously seriously minded, but they could also have fun. They were part of earthy communities. They lived their lives amongst uh, ordinary uh, people. So Orr and Boyle, if you like, reinforced this idea of conservative politics and conservative uh, religion and liberal politics and liberal uh, religion. But we also have others who disrupt those um, binaries uh, quite significantly. James Hope, Jemmy Hope, um, who was brought up, um, uh, born a Covenanter, Reformed Presbyterian, grew up in the Seceders and, of course, is one of the main emissaries of the Society of United Irishmen. He developed, if you like, a modern-day liberation theology based on his reading of the Old Testament, uh, which had very harsh things to say about Irish Anglican landlords. Samuel Thompson, who is a friend of James Orr, James Orr uh, criticised his friend uh, that his poems had the tincture of Calvinistic divinity. Um, Samuel Thompson um, was associated with the United Irishmen. He wrote a poem in uh, praise of Tom Paine's uh, The Rights of Man. But he also wrote a poem against Tom Paine's The Age of Reason. So in other words, he was democratic in terms of his understanding of politics, but he didn't like the atheism, implicit or indeed explicit, in Paine's thought. So my point is that even in the 1790s, in this hotbed of radicalism, Presbyterian religion and politics could be expressed in different uh, ways. So what happens after that then? What happens after the Anglo-Irish Union um, is brought about uh, in, uh, comes into effect in January 1801? Generally speaking, uh, most Presbyterians sort of like hide their heads or keep their heads low um, after the rebellion of 1798. There's actually remarkably little agitation about union amongst Ulster Presbyterians. But generally speaking, by the time you get to the 1820s, 1830s, most Presbyterians think the Union is a good uh, and positive thing. And this happens at the same time as evangelical religion, born-again Christianity, comes to dominate uh, the religious life of Irish uh, Presbyterians. And as a consequence of that, historians see these two things and therefore they conflate them, uh, particularly in the person of Henry Cook, um, who statues down in front of Belfast Inns, the so-called black man who's now turned rather green. Um, uh, if you want to ask me about that statue later on, uh, please uh, do. But in many ways, Cook represents the coming together of conservative evangelical religion and conservative politics. And if we're thinking about a sort of a literary expression of that, it's this uh, gentleman um, here, William McComb, um, who's, one of whose poems was dismissed by John Hewitt as flatulent with piety and was also described as that sanctimonious bookseller of High Street in Belfast. Um, so Hewitt didn't particularly like him. Uh, Macomb was a great personal friend of Henry Cook and had the enviable distinction of being known as the Poet Laureate of Irish Presbyterianism. 
Um, I hope you get a hat uh, with that, uh, I'll tell you. But William McComb in many ways represents or gives voice to the triumph of evangelical religion amongst uh, Presbyterians. He begins, he's born in Korean, uh, where all good people are. Um, he comes to Belfast, he gets very involved in popular education, particularly Sunday schools. He also sets up the Deaf and Dumb Institute um, as well, he's very involved in that. In terms of his literary influences, it is significant that Burns is not one of them. And William McComb himself hardly ever writes in Ulster Scots dialect. Instead, his heroes are a guy called James Montgomery, uh, a very famous hymn writer uh, and poet of the early 19th uh, century, who came from a Moravian background in County Antrim, and also Thomas Moore, the Bard of Erin. And in reviews of um, McComb's poetry in the early 19th century, British reviewers constantly refer to the fact that McComb is like Moore. This sense of Irish patriotism, uh, this sense of celebrating the greatness of Ireland. McComb himself does um, bring together a whole range of different uh, literary expressions in his uh, poetry. And here I want to quote um, the work of uh, Norman Vance, um, who I think has been very, very um, interesting, I think an important interpretation of McComb's uh, poetry. He argues, or he states, McComb was often specifically, even aggressively Protestant Unionist in his outlook. Yet he was at least fleetingly aware of the whole range of his country's imaginative heritage, English, Scottish and European, as well as Irish. He is able to draw on Anglo-Irish, Scots-Irish and Celtic traditions and on aspects of Ireland's general popular culture, though the results of this culture of fusion are sometimes bizarre. So Macomb, as we'll see, becomes increasingly focused on Ulster Scots themes, but that doesn't mean he forgets his Irishness. And it doesn't mean that he forgets about the general literary uh, context in which he is uh, operating. And a good example of this sort of uh, patriotism is a poem of his written in 1815 called Oh Erin, My Country, uh, which was originally published in the local newspapers and then published in his first collection of poems, <coughs> sorry, second collection of poems, The Dirge of O'Neill, uh, which was actually written in response to the death of an Irish harper. Uh, called Ar Arthur uh, O'Neill. And let me just read a couple of stanzas uh, from this, because it emphasises the, the Irish patriotism, if you like, in the Coleman's poetry. Britannia may vaunt of her lion and armour, and glory when she her old wooden walls views. Caledonia may boast of her Peabrock and Claymore, and pride in her Philibay, Kelt and her hose. But where is the nation to rival old Erin, or where is the country such heroes can boast? In battle they're brave as the tiger or lion, and bold as the eagle flies round our coast. The breezes off shake both the rose and the thistle, while Aaron's green shamrock lies hushed in the dale. In safety it rests while the stormy winds whistle, and grows on disturbments midst the moss of the vale. The shamrock is emblem of Aaron's fair daughters, in rustic retreat dwells her boast and her pride, and the old branching oak clad with ivy off shelters, the cottage where love, truth and beauty reside. Now, this is, this is the evangelical. This, you know, flatulent with piety is probably underselling it in some ways. But here is a conservative evangelical in 1815, uh, 1817, talking in very positive terms about Ireland in comparison with other parts of uh, the United uh, Kingdom. By the time we get to the 1840s, um, Macomb is uh, well established in Belfast and he also becomes associated with a text which is often known as the foundation text of Ulster Unionism, uh, the Repealer Repulse, uh, which he was responsible for publishing in Belfast in 1841. And what the Repealer Repulse is, is a, a report of Henry Cook's challenge to Daniel O'Connell to debate the merits of the Union uh, in 1841. Uh, O'Connell reluctantly comes to Belfast. He suddenly finds out that uh, most Protestants in Belfast aren't United Irishmen anymore and that Henry Cook represents mainstream uh, Protestant opinion. And it's during uh, this, uh, a, this uh, sort of public uh, spe spectacle in, in January and February 1841 that Henry Cook becomes the great Unionist hero uh, by standing up for the Union against O'Connell. And his knockdown argument is, look at Belfast and be a repealer if you can. Look at the industrial and commercial prowess of Belfast and tell me the Union isn't working 
is essentially Cook's uh, point. But Macomb is responsible for publishing the Repealer Repulsed, and he also uh, writes a, a, a number of poems in the second half of uh, the work. The most of the work, however, is actually written by James McKnight, uh, the editor of the Belfast Newsletter at that stage, who later um, becomes a prominent supporter of Tenant Wright and editor of uh, the Derry uh, Standard. So Cook is still talking about, or sorry, Macomb is still talking about Irishness, as you can see uh, from the front page of the Repeater Repulse, but it's also very much within the context of union. Um, that the union, the United Kingdom, is a way you can express both your Irishness and your Protestantism and your Ulsterness, and that's perfectly fine, according to uh, Macomb. The problem is, however, that in the 1830s and in the 1840s, Presbyterians like Macomb are beginning to get a bit fed up. The United Kingdom isn't entirely working in uh, their favour because there's a whole variety of different challenges to Presbyterian principle. So Henry Cook, the great Protestant Unionist hero, one of his big things is, try, is to try and develop Protestant unity between Presbyterians and the Church of Ireland. And in 1834 at Hillsborough, he pronounced bans of marriage uh, between the Presbyterian Church and uh, the Church of Ireland. The problem for many Presbyterians is that they don't think that the Church of Ireland and the Church of England are actually that Protestant. Because, of course, the 1830s is the period where John Henry Newman begins to criticise the established Church of England. He begins to say the way to regenerate, the way to deal with the problems in the Church of England, is to go back to the Catholic heritage. And, of course, John Henry Newman eventually um, um, uh, leaves uh, the Church of England. He becomes a cardinal in the Catholic Church and is one step away, I think, from becoming a saint in the Catholic Church. So for many Presbyterians, there's a big problem with Cook's policy of Protestant Union. These people, this church that you want us to go with, aren't actually supporting Protestant principles. Moreover, in 1843, one of the big events in church-state relations in Europe in the 19th century happens. When the established Church of Scotland splits in the so-called disruption of May 1843. Now, it's quite a technical issue, but essentially the point is that the Free Church of Scotland leaves the Church of Scotland because it doesn't believe that the government recognises Presbyterian principles. The key point here, of course, is the Prime Minister is Robert Peel, and it's a Conservative government. And Robert Peel is mates with, you've guessed it, Henry Cook. So you have all these Presbyterians going, how on earth can you let your so-called friend um, lead uh, and overturn the Presbyterian Church of Scotland? Not only that, but Presbyterians in Ireland um, in the early 1840s are literally made bastards. Um, because a, a legal case is brought before uh, the Armagh Consistorial Court in 1840, which declares that only marriages performed by Episcopally ordained clergymen, i.e. ordained by bishops, are valid in law. As a consequence, a whole, a whole host of marriages performed by Presbyterian ministers are declared illegal. Again, this is happening while the, the Tories are in government, the supporters of Henry uh, Cook. To so these um, issues about church and state and theological issues, you also have a very important social issue, and that is the backbone of the Presbyterian Church in this period are tenant farmers. The landlords are members of the Church of Ireland. And of course what you get in the, in the context of the famine is a rejuvenation of the debates about the rights of tenant farmers, which is led by, you've guessed it, James McKnight, Macomb's collaborator in 1841. And this splits... Well, it doesn't split the General Assembly because the, the Presbyterian Church in Ireland is overwhelmingly in favour of tenant right. Cook supports the landlords. And Cook actually withdraws from the church for four years until um, the uh, General Assembly deals with its uh, support for this issue. Presbyterians, generally speaking, are really annoyed that they don't have any MPs in Parliament um, to address these issues. And it also means that Presbyterians up until the 1870s do not like the Orange Order. They don't like the Orange Order because the Orange Order is associated with the ascendancy of the Church of Ireland. And as a consequence of that, Presbyterian ministers stay as far away from the, the um, uh, uh, Orange Order as possible. When the Great Ulster Revival of 1859 breaks out, the official history of that event has an entire chapter devoted to the revival and Orangeism. 
where the, um, the author, William Gibson, um, says, let's hope that the 1859 revival will, spe will spell the end of the Orange Order. Let's hope that it'll be converted into a prayer meeting instead. Um, so that indicates, if you like, this real sort of, of frustration that Protestant unity isn't working for Presbyterians. And in that context, what um, Scottish Presbyterians and Ulster Presbyterians do is they begin to reassert their Ulster Scottishness. They begin to say that the United Kingdom is a good thing, but there are distinctive things about our community that need to be uh, asserted. And Macomb becomes very much a mouthpiece for this reassertion of Ulster Scottish uh, Presbyterianism. He urges people to vote for uh, candidates in the elections who will support Presbyterian principles uh, rather than uh, uh, challenging them. And his most famous poem uh, was published in 1842, uh, uh, and it, um, according to one Irish Presbyterian, breathes the spirit of the Marseillais. So there you go. Can you imagine seeing this uh, at a Six Nations uh, game? But let me just read a couple of, of stanzas from this, because it emphasises the importance of this Ulster-Scottish connection, which is very important in terms of talking about Presbyterian distinctiveness. Two hundred years ago there came from Scotland's storied land to Carrick's old and fortress town a Presbyterian band. They planted on the castle wall the banner of the blue and worshipped God in simple form as Presbyterians do. O oh, hallowed be their memory who in our land did sow the goodly seed of gospel truth two hundred years ago. Two hundred years ago the hand of massacre was nigh and far and wide o'er Aaron's land was heard the midnight cry. May Presbyterian Ulster rests in happiness and peace, while crimes in distant provinces from year to year increase. O Lord, their bondage quickly turn the streams and south that flow, for popery is the same it was 200 years ago. There's a snigger in the room because, yeah, oh, the mask has slipped at last. Um, the Presbyterian anti-Catholicism is there, and of course Presbyterians are anti-Catholic, because Presbyterians are Protestant. But the point to emphasise here is that this idea of anti-Catholicism and the, the adverse effect of Catholicism on national life is not an Irish Protestant phenomenon in this period. And there's two good examples we can take to sort of like challenge that. When the papal aggression happens in 1850-51, the person who raises the alarm against um, Catholic bishops taking on territorial titles in England is Lord John Russell, the Liberal Prime Minister and, of course, um, um, Bertrand Russell, I think, is associated with him. Secondly, when the Vatican Council declares its um, doctrine of papal infallibility, the First Vatican Council in 1870, one of the, the foremost critics of it is William Muir Gladstone. Of course, the Liberal Prime Minister introduces Irish Home Rule. The point is that there is a general um, uh, principle within public debate in British and Irish life that Catholicism is not a good thing when it comes to thinking about identity, when it comes to thinking about uh, allegiance to the state. How on earth can you be um, um, a supporter and a follower of the Pope, while at the same time also being uh, a, a member of the state? So the point is that he might be explicit about it, he might be um, um, rather blunt about it, but Macomb is not unique. This is not just an Ulster Protestant giving off about Catholics. The point is, in terms of thinking about the 20th century, is why does this stuff still remain important in Ulster and Northern Ireland when in other parts of the United Kingdom it's not? So Cook, or uh, Macomb, in many ways, I'm trying to suggest that Macomb is, is a, even though he seems very respectable, he seems very middle class, middle of the road, he's a way to begin to think about these issues. So what are some of the, the, the sort of big ideas I want to leave you with? The first thing is, I hope I've shown that we're talking about a complex culture here in which religion, politics and literary forms could be combined in a variety of ways. Macomb, in particular, shares an Ulster Scottish worldview, um, but that didn't have to be expressed in vernacular uh, in Ulster Scots, and it also allowed religiously minded Presbyterians to make common calls with like-minded groups in the United Kingdom and beyond. This is not just an Ulster phenomenon, it's part of a broader series of questions. I suppose the final thing, and I'm here I'm um, using, uh, misusing Clinton Skinner, no doubt, um, the idea of seeing things their way. My contention would be is that a lot of the poetry and a lot of the prose that we've been talking about has been interpreted through contemporary eyes. 
what we actually need to do is begin to actually look at this material in its historical context to try and understand why these themes were important to groups uh, in that particular uh, context. What did it mean to them? How can we go about thinking about a different type of culture which many people in academia might not necessarily um, uh, find sympathy with? So those are some of my context. More than happy to listen to any questions or comments you might have. So over to you, Peter. Listen to the questions, might even answer a few. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> and I'm going to open to the floor. We'd like yeah. to ask the first question. Quickly, Norman. Thanks very much, Andrew. Terrific talk. Uh, two questions which emerged during your talk to me, which are both about kinds of accusation of false consciousness. Um, the first is that the shift that you mentioned early on from being United Irish people to being unionists, which has haunted much of the discussion of. Presbyterianism in the, in the literature. I remember you mentioned Ian McBride, I remember in McBride's book, Scripture Politics, he refers to the fact that for many of the Presbyterian radicals of the late 18th century, uh, the key to understanding it was what, that, that for them it was a kind of anti Catholic thing. And he refers to the, and his phrase is the eye catching phrase that for these people being part of the radical movement was that anti Catholic. A continuation of anti popery by another means, yeah, yeah. and that therefore there's nothing mysterious about the shift because they all assume Catholicism is on the way. Yeah. By the time it turns out that the Catholicism isn't on the way, they shift back from that kind of politics. In that sense, there's a kind of explanation which doesn't require people to have changed sides, it's just that understanding what they really thought, as you put it, seeing things their way, means that that shift is explicable. I wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah. Second is a broader point which haunts what you're saying, and I'd like your, <coughs> your view on it because it's an unfashionable question, but it seems to me that. Explaining this kind of set of religious ideas, if you believe in God, particularly if you believe in a Christian God, has necessarily to be a slightly different thing for explaining these kinds of Christian ideas if you don't. So you refer to the dominant part of literature, which I think is that secular functionalist way of explaining ideas, which of course it has to be if you think that these people are locked in some kind of false consciousness and there is no God. But if you actually believe, as some historians do, that there might be something numinous involved in this. It's a different kind of explanation because it yeah. may well be that it's about all kinds of social things and economic things, but there's something else going on as well. And this is rarely articulated in the debate, but it seems to me to haunt much of what you've been describing because if people do actually believe that Presbyterians might be onto something <laughs> what they believe, then the explanations of those who are seeing it in functional terms mm. are necessarily only at best partial and slightly my opinion. Yeah. No, no, I, um, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, let me deal with the first and slightly easier point, um, which is the yeah, no. I, I completely agree with that, and of course, one of the one of the people who has some of the hardest things to say about Catholicism in the seventeen nineties is Wolf Tone. Um, you know, who sort of oh, this is absolutely ridiculous. The very definition of tyranny is, is the, the papacy or whatever. Um, so certainly that that's the case, and it's also got to do with the other point as well, is and that's the, the changing definitions of what Republican is. Uh, you know, moving from a sort of a, a more classical understanding of it uh, to a much more sort of ethno-nationalist. Sorry, I can't believe I'm using that uh, term in public. Understanding of it. Um, so yeah, no, I certainly, I, I certainly uh, take your point. Um, so it, it then becomes an issue of um, not necessarily change over time, but circumstances changing around Presbyterians. There might be a way to think about that. Certainly. The second point about worldview um, is, um, yeah. Um, I suppose it's a, it's, a, it's a question which all historians have to think about in terms of how they th talk about what, what their, um, their, their subject matter. Um, I, I suppose my point would be not that... Um, I, I think that the question is being fair to the sources initially. And I think the problem is that Historians who look and scholars who look at something which they don't necessarily intuitively get is to try and explain it in categories which they can understand. But the problem is that might not be the categories that the person who you're um, talking about understands things. So it, it seems to me that, that when we're talking about religiously minded people, we should at least begin with the question that these people might think they are right. We might think they're completely bonkers. That's perfectly fine. But in terms of trying to understand why those people did what they did, I think 
the basic principle or the basic starting point is at least let's at least take what they say at face value and then interrogate it. Um, I, I think that's the point that that, that I would make as a methodological point because um, I think um, there's a lot of talk about the, the public value of history <laughs> and things like that and in, in many ways I think empathy is a, 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 a historical skill that we haven't developed or thought about as much as we need to about trying to understand why people who are different to us think the way that they do and in terms of the public value of what we do as, as historians in arts and humanities that seems to me to be a crucially important thing that we do to um, to develop a sense of empathy not necessarily sympathy because we can of course completely re reject for whatever reason those views but to try and at least think our way into why other people think the way that they do so um yeah, I, I don't think, my instinct is that giving historical actors their, their fair due or fair crack of the whip in terms of thinking about that is the same thing as them endorsing those views. But that's, that's, um, that's my <laughs> position in a way, um, for what it is. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, yeah. it's a Andrew, um, wouldn't want to challenge anything you said, I thought it was all spot on. Uh, but I do think putting union in your title talking in terms of the United Irishman unionism, it really does muddy the voice a lot. Mm -hmm. Because in the first place, the United Irishman weren't rigid separatists. Mm -hmm. They only moved to separatism when they, they gave up on the public reform in uh, Great Britain. And when it comes to union, a lot of the United Irishmen don't say both people. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no cause to love the Irish Parliament or the Jurassic legislation. Many were getting very nervous about France, and one of the point is France might be like as a partner. And of course, as Jonathan Wright has shown, there is a prospect for making common cause with British radicalism within the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, and, and in fact, they don't really keep their head down for the next 20 years. You look at things like the Queen Caroline affair. You know, they are, are present here now in Belfast, they're very ready to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and the real problem is that, just like Republicans and Unionism changed its meaning. Mm -hmm. Because in 1800, you're, you're talking about an Irish Parliament, which is Protestant, elected and restricted franchise. Post 1832, post Catholic emancipation, the assumption is that any Irish elected assembly would be a predominantly Catholic. Yeah. So it's not really a question of um, embracing unions and previously rejected. The very meaning of unions has changed completely. No, I, I absolutely accept your, accept your point. And I, I think union, um, <clears throat> you know, trust you to pick up on this, but I was using it very easily um, as a way to think about constitutional relationships, but also about the cultural experiences that under, under, sort of under, um, uh, pin that. Um, so yeah, no, no, I, I entirely take your point. And I particularly like the way that, you know, you can reconceptualize unionism as changing. Um, and union also changes in terms of its, its social um, bases as well. Uh, from union thinking about constitutional relationships with the elite to thinking about something that is, is more populist in terms of its outlook. Um, certainly, I think um, all those issues that you, you raise, I think, are, are, are uh, very uh, important. I think that, that's one of the problems with thinking about this issue is, um, well, it's, it's the big problem that we deal with in terms of the public understanding of history, and that is the issue of popular anachronism that what we understand by certain things today is the same that people understood in, in 1800 or 1850 or whatever it is. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the, the values of history is actually trying to maybe show how those things work. So, no, I completely take your, I completely take your criticism. Um, um, and it was me being lazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. Can I just ask about Bonds? I mean, obviously, we all know about the, the way that Bonds, the radical, in Victoria and Scotland and the whole part of the cult uh, was kind of um, well it certainly diffused the parcel of roads innovation kind of sentiment um, I, I'm just wondering about Ulster in the sense that you know was, was there a similar thing going on with, was there a, a cult that was developed that was politically convenient, useful and so on where Burns' sort of radicalism was played down or is there a sense in which you know Bonds is radical radicalism could actually be useful? That's a very good question. Um I think I only I think I can only answer that partially, I'm sorry. Um but I, I think certainly for people like Macomb, 
uh, Burns is, is a really problematic figure. Um, not necessarily because of his, his radicalism, but because of his personal morality. And uh, there's, a, there's a real squeamishness about celebrating uh, somebody whose um, sexual promiscuity was pretty well known and whose drunkenness was pretty well known. And um, whenever Robert Burns' son visits Belfast in the, the 1840s, um, you know, Macomb writes a poem in praise of Burns, but it's sort of like, oh dear, I don't really want to, you know, I have to try and excuse this in some ways. Um, so certainly for, for religiously minded people like Macomb, Burns is problematic because he, he represents things which go against the worldview that they have about temperance and puritanism and things like that. In terms of using um, Burns in a more um, radical way, um, I, I, I actually don't know. I actually don't Do you have any? No. <laughs> I know. I know. It, it would be great, you know, that, that you know. I suspect that, you know, I, I yeah. think that, you know, that this sense of Presbyterian defiance. Yes. I think, you know, the, the you know, radical thing that Bond might think yeah. in some way, but you, you need to go and try that. But, but, but I think more generally working class defiance, I think, might be possibly the way to think about that around specifically Presbyterian, but that's, that's not, yeah. yeah. I mean, in some ways, it's a follow-up on that. I mean, you mentioning that McCone wasn't, you know, influenced as, as poet by, by Burns, but that he was influenced by Moore. Mm. Now, the word influence here, the free scholar that I am, can take a number of different forms. I mean, I can see a certain kind of Moore influence mm. in the verse forms, uh, a certain kind of jingle jangle, doggerel quality to them, which he shares with, with some of Moore, certainly. But I do wonder, I mean, more on, on the point of what Graham's making, I do wonder if Moore is a model specifically because of Moore's equivocations <coughs> politically. Okay. That, that Moore can be radical to a point. Okay. The, the point yeah. being that at which he might lose his middle class or English audience. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's to put it very crudely, and mm. quite cruelly yeah. about Moore. But I, I do wonder if Moore as a model is useful precisely because here is someone who doesn't quite fit mm. um, mm. in the same way that you were talking about a number of these mm. other people not quite fitting. Mm. You know, that, that Burns is unequivocally radical. Yes. And promiscuous and all the book on yes. as well. Yeah. But yeah. Burns is precisely an equivocator. I, I, yeah. Um, I like that point. Um, I like that a lot. Um, I, I just don't know how to answer it because Unfortunately, my, as I say, my, my reading of, of Macomb as literature uh, and my reading of, of Moore is, is not sophisticated at all. Um, and I, I think generally speaking, I would say I find it, I find it difficult to think about Thomas Moore um, because he's actually, in comparison with other Irish poets, not received as much attention as he probably deserves. Would that be? Be, be a fair well, point. I mean, I mean, to make, I mean, to make, the general point of it, you know, quite about to pick up Norman Vance, one of the few people who really has done serious yeah. work on, on this kind of thing. And, I mean, what the, the lack of scholarly attention that you're talking about to this group of writers could be generalised to a lot of the verse of the 19th century. Right, yeah. Really, yeah. It's only yeah, yeah. recently, for instance, it's only like Manga, <clears throat> really major figure, yeah, yeah. is beginning to get into the studio. And again, a lot of this is to do with the fact that, you know, I mean, I, I suspect that Lacove is, is like, say, someone like Mangum, publishing in ephemeral places in newspapers and journals mm. as much as he's publishing in, in you know, the slim volume. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and there is a kind of, there has been a with focus on the slim volume. Oh, absolutely, that's, absolutely. That's yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I do take mm. a point of view about, the, about ignoring this, this tradition. That's part of a wider yeah, yeah, absolutely. Of, um, yeah, and and just just to add another comment there, the other poet who's begun to receive some attention is Sir Samuel Ferguson as well. Um, you know, who is also part of that. Um, I suppose in some ways it's a bit of a reaction to um, Victorian values, <laughs> and sort of uh, there is a sort of a, a scholarly context in which these things haven't been read, um, which is I suppose a rejection. Of, 
the 70s and 80s of a particular form of politics, which Macomb and others might be associated with. Um, <laughs> maybe with uh, President Trump now, we can maybe come back and see William Macomb is a, a forerunner of um, the religious right in modern America. <laughs> who, would, who, who, who would know? But, um, but yeah, no thank, you, no, thank you for that. That's a very good point. Okay, any other questions? Yes, um, the, the idea of Protestant government for Protestant people, uh -huh. is that Protestantism generic or is it Presbyterian? Did Presbyterians as a majority community in Northern Ireland capture the highest ranks of the Northern Ireland Union state? Mm. To what extent did Presbyterianism under unionism find some kind of recrudescence, some kind mm. of we are a Presbyterian mm. in Northern Ireland, not a generically Protestant one? So in a sense, how many, yeah. for example, there were six prime ministers of Northern Ireland, how many of them were Presbyterian? Craig was. Mm -hmm. Craig was Andrews. Oh, Craig. Andrews. Burke wasn't. Craig Andrews and Paul. I'm sure. Craig Andrews, yeah. yeah. Oh, three. Um, there's, I think, um, okay, um, there's um, Patrick Mitchell wrote quite a fine book on evangelicalism and Protestant identity in Northern Ireland, and he described the Presbyterian um, worldview, if you like, between 1920 and 1965 as at ease in Zion. You know, this idea that, uh, certainly in terms of the leadership of the Presbyterian Church, the Northern Ireland state was a positive thing. Um, that they felt that this was a, a state and a government that better represented their views. Um, so, for instance, for the first 11 years of the Northern Ireland Parliament, the Parliament met in the Presbyterian College at the bottom of University Square until Stormont was built. Um, you also had two Presbyterian clergymen who were ministers of state, uh, Robert Corky, uh, who was minister briefly under Brooke and was fired for being ineffectual. Um, and then also uh, Robert Moore, who was the Minister of Agriculture. Um, so from that point of view, a very strong identification with the state. But at the same time, in the 1920s and 1930s, there's an awful lot of frustration on the part of Presbyterians with the Craig government. Um, they get their way in terms of education, largely because it occurs at the time of the, the boundary um, issue is, is, being, um, uh, is, being, is going to be sorted out in 1925. Um, and the Protestant churches get the Orange Order on board. So they're able to uh, basically forced through two amending acts to the 1923 Education Act, which allows for simple Bible instruction in Protestant teachers. At the same time as they, they win that battle, they completely lose the battle when it comes to censorship. They completely lose the battle when it comes to trying to introduce some kind of local option, um, you know, uh, curtailing the liquor trade <laughs> in, in, in Ulster. You also have a situation where a Presbyterian minister is imprisoned um, uh, T.M. Johnson, uh, who's imprisoned um, for contempt of court for criticising uh, the government so much. Um, and you also have letters being sent to Craig lamenting the fact that there are not enough Presbyterians in senior positions within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. Uh, and the Northern Ireland Civil Service, I, I think generally speaking, still remains quite Church of Ireland rather than Presbyterian. Um, so I think generally speaking, um, there is a, a sense of we're happy with this, but there's also continued tensions there. The other general point I'd make just about Protestant is um, I, Protestant in that context is open to so many different interpretations. Um, religious, non-religious, social class, you name it. Um, so, sorry, that's a lot of general comment. Does that answer your question or does that... No, it goes a long way to do it. Okay. <laughs> I have two two final questions. Okay. Perhaps, and it's really your first one is is about relationship, political relationship with Catholics and potential cooperation with Catholics. Okay. There obviously, I mean, as you as you point out to us very effectively, the great experiment of the seventies and nineties ends catastrophically. Those conservative Presbyterians who were always opposed to it can say we told you so at the end. But as you move into kind of you know the eighteen forties, eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, there is still this option of a potential. You know, collaboration with, with political Catholicism. We see it in the, the tenant right movement of the late 1840s, early 1850s. We see it perhaps in the very early phases of the Land League mm -hmm. campaign. So we have Presbyterian clergy involved in both of those initiatives. You know, Isaac Nelson very famously in the, the later phase. 
Under <coughs> what conditions, within Presbyterian political thought, under what conditions is it legitimate or indeed viable to seek a political alliance with Catholic mass politics and under what terms mm. in this period? Because it's not simply that there's a kind of blanket refusal to consider it after mm. 1798. I mean, we see various episodes where it is considered as an alternative to seeking alliances with, with British political forces. Yeah. So that's the first question. Second question is about um, devotional revolution, you know, obviously the Emmett Larkin thesis about the, the exclusion or the marginalization of the vernacular in Catholic religious culture. Yes. After after the famine, to what extent does this ex, you know, decline of the vernacular in Presbyterian culture connected with some form of Presbyterian devotional revolution, particularly the, the, the desire for respectability, mm. um, the sort of the, the increasingly middle class character of the, the clergy, social aspirations, and the kind of changing the social environment of the second half of the nineteenth century. Mm. Yeah, no, th thank you for those, Peter. Um, in terms of, you're, you're absolutely right, and you know better than anybody else in the room about sort of the land issues, something can bring uh, Presbyterians and, and Catholics uh, together. Um, in terms of the broader political issue, it's, in some ways it should be easier after disestablishment for Presbyterians and Catholics to make common cause. Because the problem in the 1840s and 1850s is you still have a Protestant state church in Ireland. And the bind for many Presbyterians is hedging your bets about which way you're going to go. Are you going to go and support a sort of like what we might call a secular type of politics and political reform? Or are you going to side with maintaining the Protestant nature of the state? And that's ultimately where Cook wins out. Um, because by the time you get to the post disestablishment period, you're dealing with a theoretically a religiously neutral Irish state. Um, but by that stage, Rome rule is the big, the big issue. So in, in some ways, it's got to do with the, the calculation about thinking about church-state relations and the balance, I think, between those. And of course, one of the main reasons why the, the League of North and South breaks down is to do with the papal aggression issue and and McKnight finds it incredibly difficult to try and keep religiously minded conservatives on board in the north um, and it, it founders over uh, over that issue. I think McKnight well I think McKnight is fascinating because McKnight is clearly a conservative Presbyterian uh, very much so in terms of his theological outlook but he also is against um, subscription in the 1830s, in other words, ministers signing a statement of faith and become a minister in the church. Uh, and that sort of principle leads him to a divorce between religious principle and political action in certain circumstances, which then allows him the space to say, yes, I can be part of, of this broader movement about bettering human life, which he can also then justify as an evangelical way of improving the world. <laughs> um, you know, so I, I think it, it has got something to do with thinking about uh, the Protestant nature of the state versus a more um, um, secular understanding of it. Um, the other issue there, of course, is higher education uh, and how Presbyterians think about that and why it is by the time you get to the late 19th century, Presbyterians are overwhelmingly in favour of a non-denominational secular education, whereas in the 1840s they were a bit iffy about it. But by that stage they see it as a way to try and and combat the issue of, of Rome rule in, in education. So, sorry, that's a bit all over the place, but I think that's how I at least begin to answer that. Does that...? Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that, that strikes me is that in 1852, kind of political dogfight in 1852, the issue that's coming up, say, in the Belfast newsletter more than any other in appeals to Presbyterians is the loss of the Reggie and Donald. Okay. And okay. How, mm -hmm. the extent mm -hmm. to which, the, you know, the <coughs> followers of McKnight are accused of betraying their own Presbyterianism mm -hmm. by supporting Sean Crawford, who's very much opposed to the, the continuation of the religion of Donald. So it's, you know, that, that's a further complicating factor, I think, this idea that Presbyterians can undermine Presbyterianism. Yeah, yeah, um, because of the issue of the state support yeah. for, for the church. Yeah, um, yeah. And that, you see, I get, that, that's the problem, generally speaking, with the Presbyterian experience in Ireland historically speaking. Um, on the one hand, they have so much in common with 
Irish Protestantism in general. But at the same time, they're also fighting cat and dog with the, the Church of Ireland. And from that point of view, they have a common enemy that Catholics and them can uh, d- to fight against. And that's the issue that's coming up in the 1850s as well, because on the one hand, you have uh, Presbyterians who are remain committed to the idea of a state church. And the idea that Presbyterianism can be endowed in Ireland is incredibly important for them in terms of their understanding of Presbyterian ecclesiology and stuff. But at the same time, um, you're also in a, a country where the state church really doesn't like you in many ways, particularly at, at the leadership level. And that causes that real sort of like friction and uh, problem, which is why, um, in many ways, this establishment is actually such an important moment for Presbyterian politics because it, it gets rid of the state church and makes it easier for Presbyterians to make common calls to the Church of Ireland. Um, that would be my, my sense. Yeah. And the, the, um, the ecclesiastical reformation, oh, sorry, the, what am I saying? Devotional, Devotional revolution. revolution. Revolution and uh, yeah, I, I, I think on one, way, on one hand, yes, I think there's a lot in that, but on the other hand, you're also getting middle class Presbyterians who are beginning to enjoy this stuff. Uh, and at the same time as you have people like J.M. Barry and people like that in Scotland who are beginning to write Kailyard type of fiction, mm-hmm. you also have it in uh, middle class Ulster as well, where people like Archibald McElroy, John Stevenson and people like that are writing um, uh, uh, novels in the vernacular to appeal to a middle class audience who are tickled by this, this type of stuff. So I, I think certainly on one hand, I think in terms of the popular use of vernacular um, things like national education, respectability are very important in terms of uh, wiping that out to some degree. But at the same time, there's also a resurgence of it amongst middle class um, uh, uh, Protestants, in there, which of course mirrors what's happening amongst uh, nationalists as well in terms of the game of revival. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. That was a great paper.